Well, hello and welcome to YouTube. Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based, of course. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here today, as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. So, up on the side, as we jump into chapter four in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math One textbook on writing linear functions, this very first section, section 4.1, is on writing linear equations using slope intercept form y equals mx plus p so we came off graphing right now we're writing the equations i don't think we're really doing much of any graphing in this particular chapter chapter five a little bit of graphing but alongside writing some equations knowing how to do them all that so how do we write an equation y equals mx plus b form depends on the information you're given whether it's written information on slope and y-intercept whether it's written information on points or using function notation or if you're given a graph as well not for you to graph, but for you to write the equation or transforming it from a different equation. We've done some standard form to slope intercept form. We'll see if we have to do that here. What kinds of word problems are presented? I'm not really sure, but there's a smaller set up to 30 some odd questions. Let's see. It is 37 questions. So if you'd like to download this PDF in the description section down below, you may do so. We'll see if graph paper is necessary. If not, I won't provide any for you. And you can find the timestamps down below as well. I'm going to begin with the lecture portion and then the problem set comes afterward. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're going to learn to write equations in slope intercept form. Once again, that is y equals mx plus b and use linear equations to solve real life problems. So, you know, actually, now that I see the second one, in the last chapter, and probably specifically in the section on slope intercept form, they gave us equations here and there. They said, here's a function that models the situation. And I kept saying over and over, when do I get to make up the equation? I think this is where we get to do it now. So we'll have them teach it to us. Uh, linear model, I'm sure, probably has to do with something on real life problems. We'll see when that shows up. OK, so remember, slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. It looks like we're coming right off the bat with this. Write an equation of each line with the given slope and y-intercept. Literally, slope-intercept form means the slope and the y-intercept. Not the x-intercept, but the y-intercept. So if you're given these two numbers, those are the two numbers that, goes in, that go into the equation. Um, y equals mx plus b. If your slope is negative 3, that's your m value. And your y-intercept is 1 half, and that is your b value. Negative, y equals negative 3x plus 1 half is it. Now, keep in mind, slopes, I always like to write them as fractions when it comes to, excuse me, represent them as fractions when it comes to the graph, but I couldn't care less whether I write this as negative 3 or negative 3 over 1. That's why you're probably just going to see the answer not over 1, but just negative 3 itself. And a y-intercept of 1 half, I generally don't like to graph with a y-intercept of 1 half because then that means I have to start halfway between two numbers, but we're not graphing it. We're just writing the equation. And don't think just because you're given one of them as a fraction that it goes in with the x term. And remember, the slope multiplies with x. Part b, the slope is 0 and y-intercept is negative 2. y equals 0x plus negative 2. Remember, adding the negative becomes subtraction. But hey, where did this term just go? Oh yeah, it got multiplied by 0. I think it's a good time to remind you, I, is, is this a correct answer? Yes. Is it simplified? Not really. It's one of those things where I guess either is kind of accepted, but you want to, number one, you want to be able to Indicate it like, excuse me, uh, let's see how I want to say this. You want to know what this means. You want to know what this means. You want to know what it means for why is this term missing? Oh, it's multiplied by zero. So you want to be able to write that simplification for yourself. And if we're ever going to match it to an answer key, this is how it's going to look. Okay, those are the easy ones. Straight up, slope, y-intercept, whether they say m and b, slope and y-intercept, you write it in that form. Boom. And we're always using y equals mx plus b. What if we use a graph? Well, on, in these two particular graphs, and listen, um, we're going to use different forms throughout the chapter to write equations in. In other words, called point-slope form, which doesn't necessarily use the y-intercept. So they might just be using the y-intercept solely on these points and say, identify that, make that your b-value, and then find out your slope as well. So on part A, your y-intercept here is negative 3. Straight up, y-intercept is negative 3. They say that, and so we should use it. Sorry, I should move myself. So that's your b value, negative 3. Not the 0 portion, but just the negative 3. The m is finding the slope between the two points that you're given. So you can do a rise over run. They're doing a calculation. I'm going to save the calculations for when you're not given a graph or when it's less likely to use. But this is the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. To remind you how I can do it without the calculation itself. Notice how they get 6 over 4 as their calculation. That's because they're doing 3 minus negative 3. That is a rise of 6. You're actually counting how much 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then a run from 0 to 4 of 4. So using the graph might be an easier count for that. And remember, up and right is positive. 
So 6 over 4 reduces to 3 over 2. Yes, do reduce your fractions, uh, please. And please leave them also as, a, uh, as an improper fraction, if you can. That's fine. So y equals 3 halves x minus 3 is your final result from that. Remember, negative 3 was your y-intercept. Part B, I have a y-intercept of 2, so I'm going to be using that one. You can see that in the answer, negative 3 fourths x plus 2. How the negative 3 fourths come into play? Well, it's a negative slope. We're going down as we're going to the right. And how much are we going down? From this point to this point, we're going down 3 as we go right 4. So negative 3 fourths is it. Of course, they use the calculation version. I'll save the calculation version again for when we're actually calculating. I'm sure they're going to give us some with given two points to do that. So I'll save it for those ones. And here are those ones. Okay. So using points to write equations. And as kind of expected from that last set on graphs, we're probably going to still stick to this. Notice that each of these contains a point where the x value is 0. Now, I want to just go ahead and state now that although we're going to be using different Maybe they're going to challenge us later, but we're going to, in different sections, also use different forms to write equations that are probably faster and more beneficial to use when you don't have the y-intercept. Recognizing that you have the y-intercept in these two cases here, y-intercept in these two cases here, slope-intercept form makes most sense. You are able to write slope-intercept form without knowing the y-intercept by finding it using different measures. It doesn't seem like so far this section is doing that. That being said, each of these are the y-intercept of negative 1 and negative 5 in both of these equations. So when it comes to a final answer, notice you have a minus 1 here and a minus 5 here as far as those terms. The slope is still finding the um, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is where I'm going to use that formula. So y2 minus y1 is negative 1 minus 5 over x2 minus x1, 0 minus negative 3. 0 minus negative 3 is 3. Negative 1 minus 5 is negative 6. And negative 6 over 3 is negative 2. So that's your slope on this one. On this one here, they're doing negative 5 minus negative 5, which is 0, over 8 minus 0, which is 0. So no rise, some run, you get a slope of 0. And as we saw before, if the uh, slope is 0, then that means you're just left with the constant equation, y equals negative 5. Writing a linear function. Uh, write a linear function f with the values f of 0 equals 10 and f of 6 equals 34. This is where I was saying function notation could be used f of 0 equals 10 means there's an order. Oh, they write it right here. Duh, I forgot. It's an example. They use that to write the order pair 0, 10. Remember, function notation means f of x, which is a way of saying y, equals that number. You know, f of x equals y. This is the x value. This is the y value. This is the input. This is the output. So input x, output y. So that's that ordered pair. And this input of 6 gives you an output of 34. So plug in 6, get out 34, and those are your points. And then you could do the same thing. And it, as you can tell, once again, one of these is your y-intercept. Value of y when x equals 0, that's 10. The difference between 34 and 10 is 24. The difference between 6 and 0 is 6. 24 over 6 is 4, which is your slope, your rise over your run. So y equals 4x plus 10 is the final. Oops. F of x equals 4x plus 10 is your final result. Uh, that's monitoring progress, and oh, I was, I was kind of hoping that was it. Um, I forgot. Solving real-life problems. A linear model is a linear function that models a real-life situation. When a quantity y changes at a constant rate with respect to a quantity x, you can use the equation y equals mx plus b to model the relationship. The value m is the constant rate of change, and the value b is the initial or starting value of y. You know, I, I feel like we did write some equations here and there. They were kind of few and far between. Maybe they were in the reviews or critical thinking. But I remember once or twice at least saying, hey, guys, here's my rate of change. Maybe it's a function notation problem. But here's my rate of change. Here's my initial value. Let's write this as, I don't know, g of x equals. Maybe it was the function notation things. But anyway, we've done it a couple times. Now let's use these examples and make sure we can do it each time. Here's the example. Excluding hydropower, U.S. power plants used renewable energy sources to generate 105 million megawatt hours of electricity in 2007. Now, that is just information. That doesn't look like a rate. By 2012, the, the thing I'm looking at right now is five years later. By 2012, the amount of electricity generated had increased to 219 megawatt hours. So I don't see any rates there yet, but I see a comparison of values. Over the course of five years from 2007 to 2012, we increased from 105 million to 219 million. In my head, I see that as 114 million megawatt hours of electricity. Write a linear model that represents the number of megawatt hours generated by non 
hydropower renewable energy sources as a function of the number of years since 2007. Okay, they're going to say the problem stuff for you as well. Um, I'll see it written. But for me to kind of mention this right now, they say since 2007, that means, you know, when they use 2007 and 2012, those aren't the literal X values we want to use. And yes, normally X is our time. In this case here, we're going to use 2007 as our year zero, as our Y intercept, our starting amount. We start with this many in the year 2007. I'm, and by the way, we'll do this in millions, so I'm just gonna say 105. I'm gonna use 105 likely as my B value, as my Y intercept. My slope is going to be how much did I rise, I think 114 million I said, how much did I rise in million of megawatt hours over the course of the next five years, over that run. And that's what you're going to see here probably in some form. They said you're asked to write a linear model from 2007. So, oh, and predict the number used in gener uh, generated in 2017. So we'll use our equation for that. Um, oh, here it is. Let X represent the number of years since 2007. So we want when X equals zero to be year 2007, that means X equals um, five is the year 2012. So these are two points we have on the graph and notice these will be represented in millions. So 105 million megawatt hours of electricity, 219 million, et cetera. So those are two points. That means this is your Y intercept we can use 105 and our rise of 114 over our run of five equals 22.8 in word problems. And I've stated this before, word problems are times when we're probably going to use decimals instead of improper fractions for these. So now we can call this 22.8 million megawatts per hour. Um, is that it? Megawatt, megawatt hours per year on average uh, of increase. I, that was a totally broken sentence. Um, but that's the increase as a rate, okay? So y equals mx plus b. Now they wrote it backwards. They wrote y equals b plus mx. I'm probably gonna stick with mx plus b, but that's kind of the description, right? You start at 105 million, then you add this many per year for this many years. Now we're going to predict what it is after 10 years, assuming this average maintains itself. You substitute 10 in here, apparently you get 333 megawatt hours of electricity in the year 2017. And you want to write that. Here it is. You want to write that, um, you know, as an answer with units, with units. I'm guessing that's the final thing. It is. So we're going to do the vocabulary and core concept check for this set. A linear function that models a real life situation is called a, that was linear model, right? It's called a linear model. I mean, that should be the answer, but I'm making sure that's the words they used. And in writing, explain how you can use slope intercept form to write an equation of a line given its slope and y intercept. Well, I'm just going to say this verbally more so out loud. The slope is m, the y intercept is b. So you're going to write it in y equals mx plus b form. Uh, this, again, it's a number, whether it's two thirds or negative four or whatever it is. And the y intercept is uh, specifically the value of y when x equals zero. Right? That's what you're doing there. But you substitute them into there. So how you use the form to write the equation, you plug those numbers in. Substitute. And that's my explanation. Okay, so guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. It probably seems like a little bit of a short set, especially once we pick up, you know, when we do blocks of problems, I get to probably speed up later in the problems after explaining it once or so, you know, a few times, maybe half the time, because they'll kind of repeat themselves. And what we're seeing for all of these so far, unless challenging problems say otherwise, is they're giving you the y-intercept as one of the points, where an x equals zero. So it looks like they really want to emphasize we should use slope-intercept form when slope-intercept slope intercept form makes most sense to use. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's going to look nothing like that. I need to move to the next slide. It's going to look something like this. Okay, in exercises three through eight, write an equation of the line with the given slope and y-intercept. Okay, I'm going to leave that information over there, but I'm going to write it the same way like this. M equals two and b equals nine. So that'll be the equation y equals two x plus nine. Literally slope is m, y intercept is b, and y equals mx plus b form, that's it. These will actually go pretty fast. This is as direct of a substitution as you can get for all of these. Sometimes we'll write a simplified version like this next one. Next time your slope is zero, your y intercept is five. So this is the equation y equals zero x plus five, but of course, we're not writing just that. We're going to write y equals five. Zero times a number is zero. Zero plus plus a number is that number. So just five. And again, it's a reminder to let you know that that's why it's a horizontal line. It has a slope of zero. That's what they look like. That's why it's probably good to write that. Number five, <clears throat> m is negative three. 
that's your slope y intercept is zero this goes both ways right so this time y equals negative 3x plus zero don't just leave the zero there it's good to note that this does become this and when you're given this equation that it means you have a y-intercept of zero which is just a way to lead into that so why not kind of have both in mind number six I mean these problems go very fast guys I, I should leave the rest to you the slope is negative seven and the y-intercept is one unless they're trying to trick us later on these other ones y equals negative seven x plus one and again we're not graphing these but you know you start from one as your y-intercept and you do a rise and run or a fall of seven run of one and number seven um the slope of two-thirds that's okay right for one this is just a substitution for another i was thinking in terms of graphing i love fraction slopes i'm, I'm not being hyperbolic at all i absolutely adore fraction slopes that's we rise two, we we run three and we don't really think of them as fractions at all but two-thirds x minus eight and then lastly, number eight, you have a slope of negative three-fourths and a y-intercept of negative six. If you've noticed on y-intercepts that are negative, you're adding the negative, which becomes subtraction, right? That's nothing really new for you guys, except I think it is technically our first time kind of writing the form, so maybe it is. Um, so y equals negative three-fourths x plus negative six is minus six. <clears throat> I think this goes without saying, guys, that uh, the x needs to be there. Uh, I've mentioned this on previous problems. If the x term isn't there, well, then you just have a constant function not one that's going to be increasing or decreasing over time okay numbers 9 through 12 we're going to use the graph to write the equation these were in the lecture portion and as anticipated based on the lecture portion each of these do indeed show your y intercept so what i'm going to do is use the graphs that are on that side to come up with the slope the y intercept is standing out to you and i'm going to circle all of them right now this and that oh it's not that what am i talking about this and this <clears throat> the value of y when x equals zero where you cross the y-axis is your y-intercept so for each of these problems what i'm circling is exactly that what we got to do for slope is determine the rise and run here and i i'm going to be doing a count for these problems here we're rising one and running three on number nine so your slope's written as a fraction of one third one over three not three over one and your y-intercept here is two so it's no change now that you get the information right the first thing you do on these problems is information gathering. I mean, first you understand the question they're asking, which is slope intercept form. So you say, okay, what information do I need? Slope and y intercept. So now you begin information gathering. What is my slope? What is my y intercept? You have the y intercept and that's not always the case. I think in these problems they will be, but um, there are some where you have to begin by finding the slope and then use that to find the y intercept. This is a negative slope, something to keep in mind. We are going down one and we're running one, two, three, four. So this is a slope of negative one over four. Again, not positive one over four, not negative four over one. It's very specifically that number and that number alone. The um, y-intercept being b is three. So our equation here is y equals negative one fourth x plus three. So when I stated information gathering, I was specific in the sense that the first problems that we had, numbers, I think three through eight, the information was given, right? Now I'm writing the information based off of what's here. I see another negative slope in play here as we're going down and over a certain amount. We're going down from four to zero. That's going down four. It's going to the right from negative three to zero is right three. So negative four thirds and an improper fraction is totally fine. So M is negative four thirds. The Y intercept is zero. So if you saw in previous times when you add zero, that also means it can be not written. So negative four thirds X is the way. This is something I haven't mentioned yet, by the way, guys. Um, we have with fractions in the past but as a reminder x is multiplying tech x is technically a numerator value it's not multiplying by the denominator so do not write this negative four thirds x don't put that x term so low that it can ambiguously amb ambiguously appear that it is in the denominator like this further uh, likewise do not write a slash like that and make it look like the three is multiplying by x even if that's not your intent it's better to write it higher than lower if you notice I kind of write it like in the middle I have still part of that fraction bar that's going to cut into the X in some form if you'd like to write it above a little more so negative 4x over 3 something like that that's fine that's preferred it makes sure that you don't accidentally confuse this with a linear um, excuse me with a rational function and make sure it only looks like a linear function just to make mention because that one was a fraction and I don't know if this one's a fraction coming up 
Uh, number 12, we have a y-intercept of negative 2, but that slope is a rise, rise of 1, 2, 3, 4, and a run of 1, 2. So 4 divided by 2 can reduce, obviously. That becomes 2, and we should write it as 2. So slope is 4 over 2, which is 2, and then your y-intercept is negative 2. So this is y equals 2x minus 2. Pretty quick, yeah? So far, so good. Okay, now the book will probably did calculate, they did, the book did calculations on these problems here. I used the graph to its advantage. I could count rises and runs, and that's, you know, part of what you should do as some of your skill set. These ones are not graphed, and that's not to say that you can't graph them. That might be quite a bit to actually make happen. But for these problems, we're going to calculate slopes. Now, some of them I could ask out loud. Most of them I should be able to ask out loud and you should know the answer to. It's when there are negatives that things can throw a little wrinkle into there. First of all, I can see my y-intercept right here because this is the value of y when x equals 0. So I have my b, b value. It's in place like you saw before where it crossed the x-axis or the y-axis, I should say, where it crossed the y-axis here was your y-intercept. You can't see it anymore, but you can see that there's a 0. We still need to find m by finding the rise over the run. Your slope was calc your slope formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. To re-remind you, you're finding the distances between these two values, but it can be troublesome with negatives, so I totally understand if you want to kind of go about it this way to find the numbers. So here's your slope, here's your y-intercept. Again, how much did you rise from 1 to 10? You rose 9. How much did you run from 3 to 0? You might say 3, but remember you're going 3 to the left in that case. So technically negative 3 in that case. And that's why the slope 9 over negative 3 is negative 3. So our equation is y equals negative 3x plus 10. So that's what we're going to be doing on these ones. I'm going to be showing that work, or at least I'm going to demonstrate that concept of work, even if I could just ask you the question itself, because eventually you can probably get into the ability to do some of these mentally if it best suits you. You can, of course, also plot them on a graph, not in the way of counting, but just making sense of, should have this answer been negative? Should have this been a negative slope? Because that's the that's the part we have to talk about most, right? We already know this is our b value. That's the value of y when x equals zero. But the slope, I have to figure out what's the rise, you know, from negative um, from seven to negative five. I guess it's a fall, but negative five minus seven over, and then I got to do zero minus two. Remember, if I do this minus this, then I got to do this minus that. This is negative twelve divided by negative two, which is positive. 6. So I got my b, I got my m, I got y equals 6x minus 5. Now if I double checked this on a graph as far as what the points were, this is really rough sketch. Watch this. I go 2 comma 7 and I go 0 comma negative 5, those two points. Does it make sense that this was a positive slope? Yes. Does it make sense that it's a sharp slope? Yes. With my very rough sketch even, I have a great idea of what, well, I guess don't worry about it. I have a very great idea of what this graph should have looked like having a positive 6 slope, right? I didn't count that rise and run or whatever, but what we literally did was we fell from 7 to negative 5, that's down 12, and we ran 2 to the left. That's why those two were negative. Could have I ran up, or could have I risen 12 and ran 2? Yes, that's still 6. That's still 6. Um, I'm sure there are other videos that I have this and I'd, I'd make this recommendation and so far the first three problems are doing this. Notice how the x values are bigger on the left value than they are on the right value. And this goes to another question that we could talk about. Do you have to do y2 minus y1 like this or can I make this y2 minus y1? Yes, you can absolutely make this y2 minus y1 here and x2 minus x1. I kind of prefer, and I've talked about this with run, by run... Uh, um, by default, you run to the right. So I would recommend you do your bigger x value minus your smaller x value. Keep your x's positive, and then ask yourself which way y is going up or down based off that. So this time when I do slope, let's do this y2 minus y1, negative 4 minus negative 4. This is one of those special cases, though. Over x2 minus x1 is 2 minus 0. This time my bottom's positive, so I can never have a negative over negative right? I can never have that. And then you're really asking yourself, are you rising or falling? Or falling? In this case, you're kind of not doing either. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0, and 0 over 2 is 0. Now, your y-intercept is negative 4. So when it comes to an equation of a slope of 0, 
and y intercept of negative 4 we have 0 x minus 4 but of course that just means y equals negative 4. it appears no matter what value x is whether 2 or 0 it's going to be negative 4. if it was 6 it's going to be negative 4. y is negative 4 no matter what. now number 16 when i look at my two x values again what's the bigger number zero or negative six zero is right negatives are smaller so for negative six comma zero which by the way is your x intercept but not i repeat not the intercept part of slope intercept form it's your y intercept that is this is our y intercept here not something i'd love to graph when it comes to our window range but we're just writing the equation so that's the b value not this this is a nothing burger but when I compare 0 and negative 6, 0 is the bigger number. So when I do the slope, I should do x2 minus x1, which means here I should do y2 minus y1. Negative 24 minus 0 over 0 minus negative 6. As you can tell, this will turn this positive. 0 minus negative 6 is positive 6, and negative 24 minus 0 is negative 24. So we get negative 4 for our slope. We get negative 24 for our y-intercept. Our equation is y equals negative 4x minus 24. Now that we've done four of those there, let's see if we can do these next two. Oh, man, they're fractions, maybe not, or decimals, maybe not. Um, maybe, though. I'll ask it out loud. Listen, I'll answer it, but we'll still calculate it. I was thinking of skirting past the uh, slope formula, but we're still given a y-intercept, right? They're helping us. So we have a y-intercept of 5. I'll just put it right above it. There's the b. Which x value is bigger? 0 is... I want to run from negative 1.5 to 0. That is a run of 1.5. I want to rise then, therefore, well, actually, I guess fall. Wait, which way did I go? I went this minus this, this way. What's the distance from 1 to 5? It's 4, right? So we're going to have that as well. So what we were doing here was 5 minus 1 over 0 minus negative 1.5. And if you're not ready for prime time on which way to go, totally fine. Um, 4 over 1.5, here's the thing, guys. We're probably not going to write this as a decimal. Here's the thing. When I divide 4 over 1.5, I think it's a weird decimal. Let's see. Yeah, it's 2.6 repeating. I'm not going to do that. Let's do this instead. If you don't know what you can multiply 1.5 by to get the smallest whole number out that you want, you can multiply it by 10 to start with. We can multiply top and bottom here by 10. That's not the smallest set, but we'll get 40 over 15. And now let's reduce that fraction by dividing by 5. Now, you might know that dividing or multiplying 1.5 by 2 would have given you 3. But if we divide these now by 5 on top and bottom, we'll reduce the fraction into 8 over 3. And that's exactly how I want to write this thing. 8 thirds. 8 thirds. So this is our slope. This is our y-intercepts. This is y equals 8 thirds x plus 5. Yeah, don't have a decimal in your fraction, and don't write your fraction as a decimal either. Number 18, last one here, also has a decimal. So probably more to do with that, right? 0, 3. 3 is our y-intercept, and negative 5, comma 2.5 is just some other point there that we can determine some stuff with. So we got a b-value there. Let's do our... Um, do 0 minus negative 5 to get ourselves a 5 on bottom. Therefore, I'm going to do 3 minus 2.5, which is 0 0.5. When I have the answer in my head, I sometimes start writing it prematurely. 0 0.5 over 5. Now, this one does give you an exact decimal, but it's one of those things, again, that I want to give you the fraction version of it. So 0.5 is also 1 half. We can multiply these by 2. Maybe you know this one a little bit better. And then you'll get 1 over 10. So there's the best preferred fraction version of that. Again, write it as a fraction if you can. This is y equals 1 tenth x plus 3. 1 tenth x plus 3. So, so far so good. Pretty quick, clean, and contained when it comes to the fact that they're always giving you a y-intercept. They always seem to be. The lecture did that as well. So I don't think I'm going to get any surprises with there. Unless they hit a critical thinking junction. We'll see. Number 19 through 24. Write a linear function f with the given values. f of 0 equals 2, f of 2 equals 4. This is a disguised way of stating the points here of 0, 2 and 2, 4. Remember, this is f of x equals and then some expression that can represent y based on plugging that number in. This is your input, this is your output. Input, output, input, output, x, y, x, y. So where you see x, y here, even heck, x, 1, y, 1 x2 y2 sure 
but we can also write them like this. And I'm probably going to do this most times. At least I'm going to say it out loud. So we can totally tell what we have here. We got a B value, our Y intercept, and we do a slope. This time let's try and do some of these in our head, okay? We're rising from two to four. How much did we rise? Two, that's right. Two, yeah, yeah. We run from zero to two. How much did we run? Two, that's right, two over two. So that slope is one. This equation can be written as y equals 1x plus 2. Is there a, not a better way, is there a more simplified way that you might see this written as well? 1 times x is also x. y equals x plus 2. <clears throat> I'm betting my bottom dollar if I saw an answer key thing on this, this is what it would say, x plus 2. Because that's what we'd have to do, take this equation, identify, extract that 1 as a slope to be able to graph it or do whatever with it. Number 20. And if you notice, actually, as you look down the set, guys, you have an f of 0 equals everywhere. That is going to represent, once again, your y-intercept. So we're in great shape on using slope-intercept form for these. You want to use slope-intercept form when you have the y-intercept as one of your points. Anyway, so this is a case of having 0, 7 and 3, 1 as your two points here. We are, if I run from 0 to 3, if I run from 0 to 3, then I'm falling from 7 to 1. That means we're falling 6, right? 7 minus 6. That's what makes this one negative. Negative 6 over 3 is negative 2. And again, that's your m. And your b is this value right here. So this is going to be the equation y equals negative 2x plus 7. If you're uncomfortable with determining whether that slope's positive or negative, of course, do your own set of your calculations. You can also, like I said, give yourself a rough sketch drawing of these. Here's 0, 7. Here's 3, 1. I mean, are those exact? No. But is 0 left of 3? Yes. Is 7 above 1? Yes. When it comes to these points, does that look negative? Yes, it does. So it makes sense that it was a negative 2, not a positive 2. Number 21, f of 4 equals negative 3. f of 0 equals negative 2. Maybe let's at least try writing this at least for the last time here. We'll see if we can go without it after. 4, negative 3, 0, negative 2. Keep writing for yourself what these points are if you think that's going to help you come up with what you need. Um, I got a y-intercept right here of negative 2. And my slope is going to be, I want to run from 0 to 4. Again, I always want to talk about my run. Run from 0 to 4 is 4. That means I'm going from negative 2 to negative 3 there, which means I'm falling. From negative 2 to negative 3 is further negative. That's negative 1. If you'd like to see that also in, that's in its other form, that's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Gee, that's still a lot of negatives to deal with. That's negative 3 plus 2. Still don't make a mistake there. That gives you negative 1. So your slope's negative 1 fourth. Your y-intercept's negative 2. Your equation is y equals negative 1 fourth x minus 2. Number 22, let's see how much we can now do mentally given all that we're doing. Unless the fraction needs to reduce, I'm probably going to try and not write the fraction out. Now, we know our y-intercept is negative 5. This is f of 0 is negative 5, so we're good there. Here's our xy. Here's our xy, okay? You know, this is kind of tricky to look at. Maybe it's harder for, it, for us to do. From this x to this x, from 0 to 5, that is a run of 5. And that is a uh, run to 5. And then negative 5 to negative 1, we're going up 4 in that case there. So that's that one. Your b value is negative 5. So your equation is y equals 4 fifths x minus 5. 4 fifths x minus 5. Was that too difficult without writing the things? I can understand why you're like, I really need to see the numbers, though. I don't want to accidentally place something in the wrong spot. I want to make sure I'm going the right direction. What were you writing in between? I think I feel you on that one. Let's go back to at least writing the points out. But I'm copying down the problem to begin with anyway. So I got a point that's negative 2, 6, and a point that's 0, negative 4. But even still, I want to try and do as much in my head as I can. Let's see if we can just make the equation, right? What's our b value? This x plus b. b is negative 4. What's our slope? Let's run, oh, let's run from negative 2 to 0. That's a run of 2. And it's a rise... Well, a fall from 6 to negative 4. We fell 10. How do you go from a positive to negative to figure out how much you fall? What's the distance between 6 and 0? That's 6. What's the distance from 0 to negative 4? That's 4. And we're falling that amount. We're falling 6 plus 4. We're falling 10. So that's down 10 over 2. Negative 10 halves x minus 4. 
Looks like we got to reduce that anyway. Negative 5x minus 4. What I'm giving you is, again, the mental capability or the capability of mentally doing these things, if you ever so prefer. I can totally see why you may stay away from that. In which case, maybe we need to revisit. Because we're fraction reducing now. Maybe we need to just show a little bit more work. It's funny because I'm trying to endorse showing less work. And I'm like, yeah, maybe you're not ready for that. But maybe you are. Maybe you are. We've been doing a lot of these so far together. Maybe they're a little mundane. I got 0, 3. There's my y-intercept. And I got negative 6, 3. Okay, let's try this one in our heads, actually. Notice the y values did not change as x ran. If the y values don't change, that means the y value will stay the same. That also means your slope is 0. So the slope is 0. The y-intercept is 3. You know what this equation is? y equals 3. It's not just the y-intercept that's 3. It's every y value that's 3. This is going to be unchanged based on that 0 slope. That one you can do mentally. That one I expect you to do mentally, for sure. In exercises 25 and 26, write a linear function f with the given values. Okay, they're giving you some old school representations of yester chapter. And in yester chapter, we had mapping diagrams such as these ones here. They're showing x and f of x, but even more so, this is domain and range, where they show which values point to what. They're making this as easy as possible because the arrows point straight across to these numbers, even though that is in um, decreasing order. Or, uh, decreasing order. So boom, boom, boom. That means we have ordered pairs of 1, negative 1, 0, 1, and negative 1, 3. They said write a linear function f. That must mean that these are collinear with each other, which means just because you're given more points doesn't mean it's harder to do. It should technically be easier to do, especially because you get to strategize, pick and choose which ones you want to use. I would love to use this value at least as my b, the 1. And I'd probably like to use 0, 1 to help get some more points. It's better to use less negatives or more, you know, more positives or more smaller numbers, whatever. It's totally up to you. I can completely ignore this value like this one right here. Still choose these values and get an answer. If I ignored this value, I, I'll use the B. But if I ignored this one and use these ones, and you know what? Let's do that. Let's use these two numbers, these two sets here. Let's use all of them. And let's use these to get your slope. Whereas we use the other one to get the y-intercept. Just to utilize them all. So I can do like a y like like a y2 minus y1 over an x2 minus x1 like that and i can still get some value so negative four over positive two which is negative two your b is one so our equation is y equals negative two x plus one now could have i just used these two and gotten that same negative two x or negative two slope yes i could did i no <laughs> will i no you can try it Number 26, we have three sets of points here as well. So I have an x, y table. Oh, you know what? They used f of x. I'm going to use f of x here. Why not? f of x equals. And actually, it's been a minute that they've been using f of whatever. I probably should have been doing that. Is it wrong to put this? No. Or is it wrong to put y? No. But they've been using function notation ever since... They did say write a linear function f. How long have they been doing that? Write an equation of the line, write an equation of the line. Should I go back? I'll just state from numbers 19 onward, it might be a more appropriate to write f of x equals just because they instructed that. So guys, this is a quick kind of pause in the things we're doing in this video, and I'm going to change those. Just a quick note on it. Is it wrong for us to put, a, put Y? No, but was that part of the instruction for F? Yes. Did, did F show up in their part? Yes. Will this look a little sloppy now? Uh-huh. But this should be some quick doing. So, guys, I'm going to change everything to F of X here, and I'm going to try and remember that for the future. Um, not screwed by the problem. So when I said the problems were the same, they were the same. They were represented in function notation, but let's leave it in function notation. F of X equals 3. That still is a horizontal line, right? It's still y equals 3, just in a different way. All right, we're all caught up. Now we're here on number 26. We'll use function notation here as well. And we got the points negative 4, negative 2. Remember, that's an ordered pair. Negative 2, negative 1, and 0, 0. As far as y-intercept goes, you can see it right there. We got a b value of 0. And let's get ourselves a slope. Now, this time I'm going to go ahead and just use the zeros with these ones right here. So as far as this goes, our m value... We are running from 2 to 0, negative 2 to 0, and we're rising from negative 1 to 0. So that's a slope of 1 half. So we can use those ones to get that. 
and then therefore your final equation should oh should be f of x equals almost almost got me f of x equals one half x plus zero or f of x equals one half x now the error analysis questions better not say oh they should have they should have been using f of x instead of y so let's see what they have here Number 27, describe and correct the error. Slope of 2, y-intercept of 7. Well, they have their values backwards. They have 7 as their y-slope um, and 2 as their y-intercept. They have the 7. Yep, slope is m, y-intercept is b. So do I see that mistake often? I do not. I do not see this mistake often. So it should be <clears throat> because m is 2 and b is 7. If you identify those, it should be y equals 2x plus 7. No, no, I do not see this mistake often. Number 28. This time we have the graph. Let's see if they identify the y-intercept correctly. Y-intercept of 4, they have 4, and it's positive. That's good. Let's see what they have wrong with the slope. They have the x variable. I don't think the book's going to anticipate they missed the x variable. 1 minus 4 is your y2 minus y1. They put 0 minus 5. So this is a common thing that can happen, absolutely. Um, the thing is, the answer, everything they calculated after is based off their formula. So 1 minus 4 is negative 3. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. Opposite of negative 3 over negative 5 is positive 3 fifths, and that should go there. So all followed correctly, the formula has a wrong portion. If they do 1 minus, zero, uh, 1 minus 4, and by the way, those are your y's, they, sh they have to do 5 minus 0. They have to stay this. They have to stay the same direction. Stay the same direction. Blah, blah, stay the same direction. That way, you're literally going from one number to the next number, and not just kind of meeting in the middle. Of like, you go left, and I'll go down, because that's kind of what they did. They said, let's go down three, but let's also go left five. We don't go from each point down to some corner point. We go from one point to the other. So we can go down three, but then go right five, something like that. And if we do that then we'll subtract these guys minus these guys to get those numbers here. So if you want to do that, in their slope formula, they basically, they subtracted, let's say, y2 minus y1, but then proceeded to do x1 minus x2. Like that they have to subtract the same direction. And then we'll correct that. Now, everything else is right. So what the only thing that's wrong, honestly, ultimately in their final answer is that positive three-fifths should be a negative three-fifths. And that's the only thing that's going to change on slope like that. You won't get wrong. You won't get a wrong absolute value. Your sign's just going to be wrong. That's why I keep saying use the graph. And listen, use the graph. This, this is a negative slope, right? You calculate something positive, you look at your graph, you say something went wrong. That's why I said use your graphs to double check. So your slope should be, if you want to do y2 minus y1, great, but do x2 minus x1 here. So negative 3 over 5, and then their b value is 4. So their equation should be y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 4, not y equals 3 fifths x plus 4. Okay. Not many to go here. Number 29, modeling with mathematics. Word problems. In 1960, the world record for the men's mile was 3.91 minutes. In 1980, the record time was 3.81 minutes. Oh. Write a linear model that represents the world record in minutes for the men's mile as a function of number of years since 1960. Okay, so X is going to represent time, number of years since 1960. Okay, this is part A, by the way. X is number of years since 1960. So 1960 is when x equals 0. Therefore, 1980 is 20 years later. That's when x equals 20. Now, we have values of 3.91 minutes and 3.81 minutes, and they want to write this thing as a function of years since then. So keep those in mind. That means the ordered pairs that we want to use here are in 1960, it was 3.91. And in, I was going to say 1860, in 1980, it is 20, comma, 3. 0.81. 20 years later, boom. As you can see, we are improving time. Therefore, the slope is negative. That negative is not a bad thing. In this case, the time's going down. It's, I guess it's a good thing for record-breaking purposes. And so we're going to find the slope. Now, our y-intercept is going to be 
That is the time in minutes of the starting value starting from 1960. So our slope is going to be, again, we're running 20 years. We already know that. And we're going to be doing 3.81 minus 3.91. We should also understand that's a negative slope. So this is going to be negative 0 0.1. That's what that calculates to in my head, divided by 20. And this is a time where decimals are appropriate and accepted. And I'm sure they're going to have some exact version. So let's figure out what that is. I don't want to kind of write the wrong decimal here. So 0 0.005, or in this case, negative 0 0.005. Now they said, uh, write a linear model that represents the world records in minutes for the men's miles as a function of number of years. Uh, I've been using X as time. You know, you could use T and use F of T and things like that. I'll just do Y equals MX plus B. Here's your slope. And here's your Y intercept, like so. So there's my model, okay? Part B, use the model to estimate the record time in 2000 and predict the record time in 2020. I mean, both are the same thing to me. Now I kind of wish I used function notation so we could say f of x and whatever. I kind of, you know what? Can I do that? Can I still go back? Is that okay, guys? I'm going to use t. I'm going to use t and I'm going to use f of t. This is something that we start to use a little bit more in these kinds of cases. So uh, t, t times 0 times 20. So now I can say f of, hey, 2000. That's 40 years after 1960. So f of 40. So we're going to do times 40 plus 3.91 like this. And let's see what that is. So that times 40 is negative 0.2. Negative 0 0.2 plus 3.91, which is 3.71. And that's in minutes. Now, I don't know how many, how many seconds that is. It's a quick conversion, but I don't know how many seconds that is. It's going to be close to 42, 43 seconds. So 3 minutes, 43 seconds. And then in the year... 2020 and I don't know how accurate these oh you know why they say estimate and predict I believe this book I, I saw some publishing you know uh, um, uh, what do you call them you know like copyright whatever things I think it says year 2014 so I'm recording this in the year 2024 10 years after this book was published so when they said estimate the record time in 2000 it's already been whatever it is they say predict this is six years after the book was published so or at least copyright so in this case here, 60 years, 60 years after 1960s, year 2020, and I'm going to look up these times afterward. Now, why would it improve over time? Well, over time, when you have more people for a chance to do something, eventually someone's going to, you know, struck luck in that way. Not luck, literally. You know, records are meant to be broken, all those kinds of things. And I guess this one's going to be 3.61 if you use um, the progress and what happens there. Now, I need to see what those are. 0. 0.61 times 60 is 36.6. Uh, so around a 336 mile. I'm going to look up what the record mile time was in 2020. In the year 2020. Oh, it doesn't actually say. What's the fastest? Looks like the fastest in the world is 343 by Hisham El Garaj of Morocco. Uh, unless I'm seeing something wrong. That's for men. Anyway, with that being said, yeah, I think it's 343. With that being said, the other thing I wanted to mention was, and this is where the thing's going to kind of mess up. What if it says estimated in the year 3000? Eventually, we're going to get to two minute miles and one minute miles in the formula. Will we in real life? No. In real life, we would start to asymptotically flatten out a little bit. Eventually, humans can't run so fast, right? We're not horses. We're not cars. Um, so eventually we can only reach some top speed and some stamina amount and stuff like that. And you can bet that these guys probably, probably dead sprinting the whole way. They're Olympians, right? Or whatever. They're world-class. They, they're the record holders. So eventually, I mean, this, this has never been reached. This has never been reached. And I assume this one has, well, that's around 343. So maybe that's when it was set. I didn't check what year it was set. Anyway, we'll keep moving forward. That's just more hands-on stuff. Number 30. A recording studio charges musicians an initial fee of $50 to record an album. Studio time costs an additional $75 per hour. Write a linear model that represents total cost as a function of studio time. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing here. Uh, total cost, studio time. Let's do this one. Let's do C of T, cost as a function of time. I'm going to try and practice some function notation with you guys. Now this time, they gave us... They gave us... Um, 
hold on. They didn't, they didn't give us like two years or whatever to compare to. They gave us an initial fee, an initial fee, that's a startup, that's a Y-intercept of $50. And then the cost per hour, that's a rate of 75 every one hour. So your formula is y equals mx plus b, 75 times t plus 50. That will be our equation we go off of. So every hour is another increase of 75. I know we've done some of these before, these ones. Uh, part B, is it less expensive to purchase 12 hours of recording time at the studio or a $750 music software program you can use to record on your own computer? Explain. So what we're going to do is let's substitute 12 into here, C of 12. Let's see how it compares to 750, if it's more or less, or a tie. 75 times 12, I think should be 900, plus 50 should be 950, let's see. 75 times 12, yeah, 900. So this is 950, $950. So this is more than 750. So what's more beneficial, 12 hour studio recording or paying for the software program and record on your own computer? Record on your own computer. Record on own computer. Save yourself 200 bucks. Now, I don't know if like the quality is the same and if you, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff, but there it is. Okay, number 31, writing. A line passes through the points 0, negative 2, and 0, 5. Is it possible to write an equation of the line in slope intercept form just to find your answer? No. What's wrong with 0, 2? Let's, let's look at this visually. We have 0, negative 2 and 0, 5. What are these? First of all, they're two different y-intercepts is what they are, but that, that shouldn't be the only thing that calls out to you. They are points that are vertically above and below each other. Here's 0, 5. Here's 0, negative 2. This line looks like this. It doesn't matter that it's on the y-axis. It matters that it's vertical. This is a vertical line. Those two points make a vertical line, which means several things. It has an undefined slope, undefined, undefined slope, and therefore can't be written in slope-intercept form. Now, slope-intercept form is specifically y equals mx plus b. I didn't say there's not an equation for it. In fact, there very much is. We should know it based off of the ordered pairs themselves. The y values change from negative 2 to 5. The x values stayed the same. Just like when we saw the y value stay the same, we had an equation of y equals whatever that number is. The x value stays the same. The equation is x equals 0. Now, that's not the answer. This is the answer. But the equation is x equals 0. It's just that's not slope-intercept form. So, no. Number 32, thought provoking. Sorry, and by the way, the, the reason why I looked so sternly at you in the camera lens, the reason why I looked so sternly after reading that was I knew what they were going to ask after that. The whole thing is on slope intercept forum, and I said, You're not going to get me. I know what this is. Don't do this. Number 32, describe a real life situation involving a linear function whose graph passes through the point. Okay, so we want to make something up here. We could say something like where we have a starting amount of 20 and then for something later we have this so we could say something like um, you have you have um, $20 in a class fund uh, four days later the you can so let's see that passes through the point so so I'm, I'm giving the points in this one um, uh, when, when beginning a class fund. So four days later, the amount in the class fund has increased to $80. Now, I just provided the word to, which is really important. There's a difference between increasing to $80 versus increasing $80, right? Increasing $80 is 20 plus 80. Increase, increasing to $80 is, well, now, now it's 80. It went from 20 to 80. So there's a setup for that, okay. I, I mean, there there are a lot of different things you could say with that. Now, if we wanted to talk finding the slope with that, right? Doing a different kind of question instead of saying four days later, blah blah blah. I could do that one, and I'm going to place that in like a different color. Let's say that this was blue. So you could mention the other point, but you could also mention a rate. 
So what is that rate? That's up $60 and over four days. So 60 over four is 15. So you could say something else like this fund increases $15 every day. And it just happens to be the next four days when that happens. So you can either go from here to there or go from here to there and do something with that information. That's one version of what we can say. Okay, number 33, reasoning. Recall that the standard form of a linear equation is ax plus by equals c. Yeah, let's not forget that one. ax plus by equals c. Rewrite this equation in slope-intercept form. Okay, if I'm going to rewrite this in slope-intercept form, I have to get y by itself, which will require subtracting the x term from both sides like this. These terms do not combine as they have an x in it, but of course all these letters are different, so there's that. C is still positive, and I divide everything here by b. Now we're used to the whole mx plus b concept as the number multiplying in front of x is your slope, your m, so negative a over b is going to be our slope. This multiplies with x, and here's our y-intercept plus c over b like this. So here it is rewritten in slope-intercept form, y is by itself. What would you like with this, sir? Use your answer to find the slope and y-intercept of the graph of the equation, negative 6x plus 5y equals 9. Okay, now first of all, I would generally do this with these numbers in mind before plugging them in like this. That being said, we can still plug them in like this and get it done. So it's a literal equation, a, b, and c. So now we can write the equation as y equals negative and here's a over b yeah this just looks weird now um plus c over b like that oh whoops i need to actually write c and b nine over five. Oh, and times x hello um now i forgot the x so this is negative opposite of negative is positive so six fifths x plus nine fifths and i'm just going to leave them like fractions like that totally fine completely cool Number 34, making an argument. Your friend claims that given f of 0 and any other value of a linear function f, you can write an equation in slope-intercept form that represents the function. Your cousin disagrees, claiming that two points could lie on a vertical line. Who is correct? Explain. They said, given anything in a linear function f, if f is a function, then it will not be a vertical line. So if... so. Remember the, remember the writing example where, oh, these points are above each other here and therefore it's not a function, you know, it's not in slope-intercept form? We're saying this is a function. So by default, we've met some hypothesis. Because this is a function, it cannot be a vertical line. Therefore, my friend is correct. And my friend is still correct here because we're given, I mean, you haven't learned how to write slope. Listen, this section is not based on writing slope-intercept form when one of your points is not the y-intercept, but it is possible to do without having your, one of your points as the y-intercept. But especially since they're given f of 0 as one of your points and some other point that won't be on x equals 0, obviously. Uh, yes, your friend is correct, not your cousin. Number 35, analyzing a graph. Line L is a reflection. Okay, this is part of the transformation things from section 3.6. Line L is a reflection in the x-axis of line K. So here is of line K. Oh, it's a reflection. So we have to kind of make line K here. So here's the x-axis. Line L is a reflection of it, which means it's a form of changing your y values from what they were. So line K could be, if this is 0, 1, K would have a point 0, negative 1 right here. If this was a point 3, negative 4, K would have a point 3, positive 4 right here write an equation that represents line k. So you have one of two options here, but k's points are going to be, oh yeah, let's do this. Let's use line L's equation. y equals, we're going down this and over this. We're going down one, two, three, four, five, and we're going over three. So negative five thirds, y equals negative five thirds x, and then plus one. That's your slope and y-intercept, right? K's equation is a reflection in that axis. So, so this is going to be y equals, I kind of want to use function notation because I want to use it that way. Let's say L of X, L of X for this first Y and then K of X. K of X is a reflection of L of X and vice versa. Or they said L of X is a reflection of K of X, but both of them work, right? 
you reflect one, you reflect the other, you're doing the same thing. Oh, excuse me, negative L of X, reflection in the X axis. So what this means is this is the opposite of negative 5 thirds X plus 1, like so. And you can distribute the negative, which means this K of X equals positive 5 thirds X minus 1. So you can do that, or, which I'm not going to do this whole thing at all, you could get the points that I showed you right here that would represent K's equation, and then you can come up with its y-intercept, which apparently is negative 1, and its slope would then be a rise of 5 as we do a run of 3. That means that 5 thirds is your slope, positive, and a minus 1 is your y-intercept, so you'd still get the same information there. There's your line K on a visual front. All right, two more questions just past the hour mark. Number 36, how do you see it? The graph shows the approximate U.S. box office revenues in billions of dollars from 2000 to 2012 where x equals zero represents the year 2000. Okay, so here's the year 2000. This is x equals zero, boom, like that. So we have $8 billion of revenue then. They say estimate the slope and y-intercept of the graph. This one is tougher with the slope because we'd want to find another point that this crosses through uh, as a for sure, for sure. I'm going to go ahead and pretend like right here Oh, I don't know. Does that look like it's halfway up? Let's see if there's a way to state that that looks like it's halfway up. I'm going to kind of plot a point right there. Is there a better point to plot? How about this one? How about year nine? Does it does it kind of look like year nine is hitting at 10 billion? I'm going to go with that. So I'm going to say on 36, the way I see it, because they're asking me, I see a point that's 0, 0,8, which means the year 2000 is $8 billion of revenue. And then the year nine, which is halfway between eight and 10, has $10 billion of revenue. So as far as my equation goes, my, y, my B is clearly eight, but my slope, my M, is a rise of two and a run of nine. So $2 billion every nine years, $2 billion every nine years on average. So I'm gonna state that my number there is Y equals two ninths X plus eight. Now, normally I'd write some sort of decimal, but that would be a rounded number that's 0.2 repeating. So I'm gonna kind of try and leave it like that for now. Just why not? Um, oh, sorry, it says estimate the slope and y-intercept. That would just be these two numbers here. That's part A. Part B says interpret your answers in the context of the problem. Okay, well then I might have to do some sort of rounding here. I thought we were supposed to write an equation. Um, so part B, interpret them in the context of the problem. As far as the slope goes, the slope states that the the box office the u.s box office is averaging an increase of two billion dollars every nine years okay now i feel like i have to round since we're not using an equation or that's around 0 0.22 billion dollars that's 220 220 million dollars every year that's an increase that's not how much they get every year. That's how much they're increasing from one year to the next. Another and additional on top of. Now, since the pandemic and such uh, in you know 2020 and onward, there have been changes, plateau or flattening, and it's making a rise up again. But when it comes to what they did at the time, you know, this probably is what it was. Uh, the y-intercept, the interpretation there is in the year 2000, the U.S. box office generated $8 billion in revenue. Okay. Part C, how can you use your answers in part A to predict the U.S. box office revenue in 2018? Well, given that, well, okay, first of all, we could make an equation. We could do Y equals, and I, that, that's what I had, right? Two ninths X plus eight. And 2018 is 18 years after the fact. And so that can be Y equals, and I can use the fraction here, two ninths times 18 plus eight. This is nice because 18 divided by 9 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 plus 8 is 12. This is y equals 12 or 12 billion in revenue is my estimation there. The other thing I could have done based off this is from, I said year 9, right? That's the year 2009. That's halfway from 2000 to 2018. So if I did, I mean, that's literally how slopes work, right? If I increased 2 billion after 9 years, after 18 years, I increased 4 billion. 8 plus 4 is that 12. So I get that answer regardless whether I use the thing or not. Okay, and the last question here, number 37 on abstract reasoning says, 
show that the equation of the line that passes through the points 0 B and 1 comma B plus M is Y equals MX plus B explain how you can be sure that the point negative 1 B minus M also lies on the line first of all it makes sense that this would be in the form Y equals MX plus B because what's happening here is 0 comma B is your Y intercept but that part doesn't necessarily matter well it, it does uh, this is your Y intercept but why will we get m as our slope when we do a y2 minus y1 or x2 minus x1? Because when x increased by 1, our y increased by a slope worth amount in addition to it, right? So that should be happening. So our slope, our real slope, let me write slope equals, otherwise you'll get confused. Our slope equals y2 minus, what did I just do? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's B plus M minus B all over one and B minus B is zero. So you're left with M over one, which is M. So your slope is M, your Y intercept is B. You have the equation Y equals M X plus B. He said, explain how you can be sure that that point also lies on the line. Well, like anything else, when it comes to these, uh, this, so that's, that's kind of a part A. A part B to this is I have negative 1 comma B minus M. I could do the slope formula again, but I could also plug these in for X and Y. Remember, these go in this equation. Now that we know that this is the equation, let's plug in B minus M for Y. Let's plug in negative 1 for X. Let's see what our equation ends up doing. This is negative M plus B. If I add M to both sides, or subtract B from both sides, you're gonna notice everything kind of cancels out. Not really, you get zero equals zero. You get all real numbers. Now that was kind of weird, right? Uh, what, what it's showing is that Y, let's see, not all real numbers, let's see, huh? That's kind of a dumb answer that I put there. What should I be saying here? Let's do, how about we just do this? Let's just substitute negative one for X and then show that Y still equals what it's going to be. So. Don't substitute that for Y just yet. Just know that we're going to get B minus M because that's what I want, right? To show that it equals that. So M times negative one plus B and that is negative M plus B or B minus M. And that just goes to show that we get the same answer right there. That makes a little bit more sense to state because if I get all real numbers and I'm just, I'm plugging in a number to itself. So it doesn't quite work. All right, guys, that'll do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching. So slope intercept form did what it did the way that it wanted to. We were always going to use slope intercept form because we were always given a y intercept. There are ways to do it when you're not given the y intercept in slope intercept form. But section 4.2 is going to teach us a new form, brand new form, not standard, not slope intercept, called point slope form. And I'm guessing that's where they want to start enticing you to say, use this one more so if, um, if you want to write an equation of a line. If you wanted to, furthermore, you could probably put it in slope intercept form. But they're going to give that one to you. They really want to push it on to you. I want to push it on to you as well, so we're going to try that. So, guys, I'll see you in that next one, and thank you, and take care.